This morning we're going to be in Judges, the book of Judges, chapter number 20. So if you want to turn there with me, we will uh, most definitely get started in short order. It's good to have a church family. Amen? It is uh, good to have some kind of support system, right, in your life that when you're feeling a little down or if you're feeling a little blue or discouraged, you can call your church family and they will be there to help you. Amen? Uh, I know that uh, oftentimes uh, I call people within our church family here just for advice or just to vent or just to talk, and it is a great comfort to me to know that God has given me a group of people who care about me, and I hope that you feel the same way that as being part of a church family, this support group that you have is full of people that love you, that support you, even when you trip and fall and make mistakes. And they care about you, and they care about your spiritual well-being. I don't know of any other place on this earth where all of that could be said. So I think that the local church is a very important place for Christians to be and to be grounded and rooted in. I really do have pity on Christians who bounce from church to church and never really get grounded in a church family, never really get solidified in growing their roots in a church family that cares about them because they're not in one place long enough to establish those relationships. So part of the responsibility is that of the church, but the other part of the responsibility is that of the Christian. Amen? And when we all do our job, guess what? Great and mighty things happen. I want you to look at Judges this morning. Judges chapter number 20. Now, I'll tell you right up front that this is a passage of Scripture that often gives people a little bit of trouble. It is a passage of Scripture that people often read and have a very difficult time understanding. You know, I think that so often we have a hard time understanding some of Scripture because we complicate it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not, but as you're reading the Bible, you'll read things and you'll not understand them, but really when it comes down to it to answer that question, it is very simple in its explanation in trying to figure out what God is trying to do and what God is trying to say. It's almost as if God made His Word too simple sometimes. And I think that in lies one of the things that we'll talk about this morning, that here in this passage, this complex problem comes about, and God responds in different ways, and it's hard for us to understand what God is doing. But really, to understand what God is doing, we just need to look at what God is saying. And what God is saying is that He will explain exactly what he's doing, and why he's doing it, even though it may not make sense to us. Now, I want you to take your Bibles in this and look at Judges chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 28. And what I want to do this morning is ask this very simple question, why did they lose? Now, as we unfold this chapter will make sense of that question. Why did they lose? Talking about the children of Israel. They went to battle numerous times and they lost. And I want to look at and ask the question, why 
did they lose? Before we go any further with this, we really need to understand and read verse number 18. So go to Judges chapter 20 and verse number 18, and let's read this passage this morning. It says, And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God. Doesn't everything seem good so far? They went to the temple of God. They went to God's house where God's glory was, and they sought counsel from God. Amen? Then we see that they said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? We'll explain this here in a moment. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah, and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 22,000 men. Now, if you're reading carefully and following along with me this morning, in your mind you are thinking this thought. Why did they lose? They went to the house of God. They sought counsel from God. God responded to them and said, yeah, I want Judah to go first. And they went to do battle against Benjamin and yet the children of Israel lost. Are you with me so far Amen. this morning? And so we see that as a result of the loss of this battle, 22,000 men were slain. And in verse 22 it says, And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men, all these drew the sword. Now in case you're having difficulty following along. I have a short attention span so I can relate to you. What we've had here are two instances back to back where the children of Israel went to God and sought counsel of God and said, hey, can we go to battle with them? And God said, yes, go. Have Judah go first. They went, and what happened? Benjamin slew the children of Israel and killed 22,000 men. Then they went back to the Lord and they said, God, we don't understand what we're doing. So uh, we've set our battle in array. We've got uh, our soldiers prepared for this battle. God, should we go again? And God says, go again. And this time, 18,000 men died and they lost twice and God told them to do it. That's 40,000 men. I don't think anybody could read this chapter and not walk away from it asking the question, why did they lose? On the surface, seemingly, they did everything right. They asked God. They prayed and sought counsel of the Lord. They got permission from God. God said, go. They did exactly what God had told them to do. Right? 
Why in the world would God cause the death of 40,000 people? If they were going to lose, why didn't God just say, hey, don't go. They're bigger than you, they're stronger than you, and they're going to kill you. But God said, go. And ensued the death of 40,000 people. Men. Now look at verse number 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas and the son of Eleazar and the son of Aaron stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. And God does. But it still doesn't answer the question, why did they lose? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we ask, Lord God, that you would help us today understand your word that your Holy Spirit would be amongst us this morning, Father God, that we can take your word and apply it to our lives. Lord, we rely on you and your spirit, and we rely on your word, Father God. As the source of truth, the spirit is the guidance into that truth, and Lord God, you're the author of that truth. Lord, we come to you now and we ask you today to speak truth into our lives. That God, if there is something in our lives that aligns with this passage, if there is something that your Holy Spirit speaks to us about this morning, that conviction, Father God, would take place and that we would respond to that conviction and that we would take action, Lord God, to correct the things that may be not right in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to do this this morning. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to understand, first of all, the predicament that they find themselves in. Their predicament, the children of Israel, just to give you a little bit of background and to spare us some time, if you look at Judges chapter 19 and read that very thoroughly, you'll find out that the tribe of Benjamin had completely lost control of themselves. In fact, uh, sexual immorality had run rampant in the streets of the tribe of Benjamin. Rape and murder were taking place all over. They were commonplace within the tribe of Benjamin. Again, they had lost control, and now the Benjamites' wicked behavior began to affect the rest of the children of Israel. They took a woman. And to spare us the details, the woman ended up dying because of the actions of the men of the tribe of Benjamin. And so we pick up the story in Judges chapter 19, and when we look at verse number 29, we see that this woman was laid at the threshold of her house. And it says in verse number 28, And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered, because the woman was dead. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got into his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it. Take advice. And speak your minds. And so we see 
It has been broadcasted among the children of Israel that the tribe of Benjamin is out of control and now they're beginning to kill the women of the other tribes. And this man is saying, they have killed my wife. Something has to be done. And so this begins the battle between Israel and Benjamin. Now I want to point out here that they find themselves in a predicament. Now, oftentimes we find ourselves in a predicament, maybe not this severe, maybe not with the exact details that we find here in Scripture. It may be much more simple than the complex situation that Israel finds themselves in. But nonetheless, I think each and every one of us in here this morning can find ourselves at some point in a predicament, a place where we have to make a decision. How many have been there before? First of all, you find that in this predicament, there are times when a decision has to be made. It may be about a job. It may be about children. It may be about family. It may be about where you live or where you send your kids to school or what job you're going to take or if you're going to take the promotion or not or if you're going to buy that house or what church you're going to go to. Certainly, decisions have to be made when we find ourselves in predicaments. Amen? Not only that, but we may also find ourselves in a dilemma because of this. A dilemma may be some kind of trouble. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it has to do with a relationship. Maybe it has to do with finances. Either way, when we find ourselves in a predicament, we find ourselves in a place that we have to make a decision, and oftentimes we'll find ourselves in a dilemma. Something has gone wrong that has put us into a place where we have to choose one way or the other. And let me say this about making decisions. I know this very well being a pastor now for over 10 years. I've found out that there are often times that you have to make decisions when there are no good options available. Rarely do we make decisions where the options boil down to good and bad. Oftentimes we make decisions where the options are simply bad or worse. And not only that, but sometimes we can find ourselves in a disaster. Something has hit our life that has completely turned our lives upside down. This may be death, or it may be illness, or it may be the loss of a job. Something has happened where it has completely destroyed who and what we are. A predicament brings to us a crossroads where we have to make decisions about what we're going to do. A predicament brings to us a place where we find dilemma, trouble. A predicament brings to us a place where we'll often find disaster, life-changing events. And although we may not be able to relate exactly to what the children of Israel are going through here, certainly each and every one of us can relate to that. Being in a predicament, a place where we have to make a decision and there's something wrong and sometimes a disaster hits and it changes our lives. Let me encourage you this morning that if you are not familiar with what I'm talking about, hold on tight because you will be very soon. But whatever form this predicament takes, let me encourage you that at that moment that you step into that predicament, rest assured that that is the moment and now is the time to talk to God. Amen? Amen? Now is the time to talk to God. Now, not only do I want to point out to you their predicament, but I also want to point out to you their prayer. And I'm going somewhere with this, so just be patient as we move along. I'd like to point out their prayer to you. Their prayer, what we see first of all in their prayer is this, is that it is a prayer 
of diligence. Look at verse number 18 of chapter number 20. We see here it says, And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God. They didn't have cars back then. They didn't have subways. They didn't have little metro trains that run around. They didn't have motorcycles. Most often people walked, and so it took some effort to get to the house of God. And when they got there, they asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? So let me assure you this morning that this most certainly was a prayer of diligence in that they were going to the house of God to seek what God wanted them to do. Amen? Now, I also want you to notice that it was a prayer of inquiry. Look at what happens in verse number 18 as well. And the children of Israel arose, right? That takes work to arise. Amen? Uh, I realized that on Saturday after working almost 48 hours straight. And then the clean comedy night, I woke up. I felt like on Saturday I couldn't even move. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God, and look at what it says there. It says, and asked counsel of God. Look, what I'm pointing out to you is that this prayer that they prayed has all the elements of being good and wholesome and looking great on the outside. They went up and they said, let's go talk to God. Let's get counsel from the Lord. And everybody else said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go to the house of God. And when we get there, let's inquire of God what He would have us to do. Boy, that sounds like something any good Bible-believing Baptist should do when they find themselves in a predicament, doesn't it? But not only do we see that this was a prayer of diligence, and a prayer of inquiry. And boy, if I could just stop here before we move to the next point and tell you the next point is the most scary of all of this. Not only was it a prayer of diligence and that they went to the house of God. They went out of their way to go get this counsel. And when they got there, they asked God. They inquired and said, God, what would you have us to do? And look at what happens. It is not only a prayer of diligence and inquiry, but it is a prayer of response. God responded and answered their prayer. Now you would think that's good. And you would think so far that this all sounds great. They couldn't have done it any better. I don't know what they did wrong. They were diligent in seeking God. They sought God's counsel and an inquiry. And God responded back and said, yeah, go do it. The fact that God responded ought to make each and every one of us soberly think about what's going on. Do you realize this morning that God will often respond to us in our folly? Amen. That sometimes God will answer us according to our folly. Amen. Let me submit to you this morning that that is why God responded to them. That He is simply answering them in their foolishness. Amen. But let me show you something. It was a prayer of diligence. It was a prayer of inquiry. It was a prayer of response. But you know, in all of those things, this prayer was lacking something. And what it was lacking was preeminence. You say, what in the world do you mean? Let me give you just a snapshot into the point of all of this. What we find in Judges chapter 20, verses 1 through 11, is interesting. 
Because it's not necessarily what we find in there that answers the question, it's what we don't find in there. And unfortunately, what we don't find in there is the children of Israel asking God, should we go to battle at all? Amen? I think that they just assumed that what they wanted was what God wanted. And so they went through the motions and they worked off of that idea. And when we come to a predicament, we will often begin to formulate our own plans. Amen. And you know what we do? We begin to formulate the solution. And we begin to formulate the plans and what we want to do. And then you know what we do next? Because we don't want anybody to think that we're not operating spiritually. We get on our knees and we say, God, I need to be diligent in seeking you. God, what would you have me to do? Right? Of course, what, what I've already formulated makes perfect sense. So I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want that, God. Right? And we approach God, but in the back of our minds, we've already got the blueprints drawn. And let's be real honest with ourselves this morning, should we? If we're real honest with ourselves most of the time, we really don't care what God thinks anyway. When we've got the plans drawn, it really doesn't matter if God agrees with it or not. We're probably going to do it our way, despite what God says. So God often will say, sure, give it a try. It lacked preeminence, meaning that it lacked them giving God his place first. As you can see in verses 1 through 11 in Judges chapter 20, they begin to formulate their plans of what they're going to do. Look at what it says in verse number 1. Then all the children of Israel went out of the, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead unto the Lord and Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. They've already got their plans going. Let's get our soldiers over here. Right? Then said the soldiers in verse number 3, the children of Israel, tell us how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came to Gibeah and belongeth to Benjamin. That belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And he tells the story of how his wife died at the hands of Benjamin. Look at verse number 8. And all the people arose as one man saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against by lot. Uh, go up by lot against it. Folks, they had the plans already drawn. 
We don't get two verses into chapter number 20 after this incident takes place when they're already raising the troops to go to war. And they said, bring that man over here. Have him tell us what happened. And so he tells the story and they get all stirred up. And the leaders say, not one of us are going back to our house. We will not sleep. We will not rest. We will now go up against Benjamin and Gabeah. The problem is, is that all of this happens in verses 1 through 11. But their diligence and inquiry to God doesn't happen until verse number 18. Do you see where I'm going with this? I think that if we're honest with ourselves, we can relate to this. We find ourselves in a predicament, and so what happens? We pray, and it may be a prayer of diligence, and it may be a prayer of inquiry, but make no mistake about it, we've already formulated our plans. And not much is going to steer us in any other direction. Now, not only do I want you to see their predicament in their prayer, but I want you to see their presumption. Their presumption is found in chapter number 20 and verse number 22. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. Listen. Their presumption was very simply this. They presumed that God was in their plans that they had made before they went to God. We do this. We do. We all do. We find ourselves in a predicament and we start to formulate the plan and we come up with all the answers and all the solutions and then what do we do? We go to God and we say, oh, by the way, God, would you put your stamp of approval on my plans? Because they're so amazing. I just don't know why you wouldn't put your stamp of approval on them. Lord, you'd have to be crazy not to because, I mean, these plans are solid. And you know what? You know the scary thing is? Sometimes God says, sure, give me those plans. There you go. You get what you want. Be careful, because sometimes you get what you ask for. Adam and Eve learned that lesson the hard way. So did many others. Now the children of Israel in Judges chapter 20 are learning that same lesson. Same lesson that we need to learn. Amen. That when we find ourselves in a predicament, we don't start to formulate the answers. We don't start to come up with the solution. And we don't go to God and say, God, I've already got the solution. I've already got the plans. I've already drawn them up. All I need is for you to put your stamp of approval on it and we'll be good to go. No. That's the presumption. I think that if we're honest with ourselves this morning, each and every one of us would be guilty of this sin of presumption. Presuming that God is in our plans because they're so great after all. Look at what it caused the children of Israel to do. Look at this in verse number 23. It says here, And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord. This is after 22,000 men had already died. And wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord. There's that diligence again. God? 
saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against them. And you say, Well, what's wrong with that? They're still asking from presumption. Verses 1 through 11 is God, is, is the children of Israel saying, We are going to battle. Oh, yeah, don't forget, we got to go ask God. But we're going to battle. Then they go to battle. 22,000 men die. And what do they do? Verse 22. And the, and the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. They're not deterred. This failure did not deter them at all from believing that God was in their plans. They said, well, these plans are so good, it's got to work. Let's try it again. So they put their battle, their, their battle in a row that they prepared all of their soldiers and they prepared to go to battle just like they did the first day. And what did they do? Oh, wait, we got to go ask, go check with God first. We got to have God put his stamp of approval on our plans again. They're doing the same thing that they did the first time. And it doesn't take a genius to realize that when you do the same things, you get the same results. And in order to get different results, you need to do different things. One of the scariest verses that we find in Scripture, and you don't have to turn there for sake of time, but in Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse number 4, the Bible says this, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. That is God saying, I, the Lord, will answer people when they come to me. But sometimes I'll answer them according to the multitude of their own idols that they have set up in their heart. I'll submit to you this morning that the children of Israel had set themselves up as idols in their own heart. Their plans as idols. And God simply is fulfilling what he told Ezekiel. I'm going to answer them according to this idol that they have. Sure. Have Judah go first. Oh, you want to do it again? Okay. Sure. Go again. Right? Causes them to press deeper. but it also causes them to lack an honest evaluation. Look at verses 23. It says, And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. You know what? I think even at this point, the thought has not even crossed their mind that maybe God's not in their plans. I think that's why 40,000 people died. Because God's saying, this is the only way I'm going to get your attention. This is the only way I'm going to get you to the place where you realize I'm not in your plans. And so that stopped them from looking at their own life, looking at their own behavior, looking at the way that they solved this predicament. It stopped them from doing an honest evaluation and saying, what are we missing?
Because on the surface, everything looks spiritual. I prayed, I brought it up at prayer meeting at church. I, 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 I called the pastor and got counsel from him. I called my Christian friends at church and asked counsel from them. I even fasted and prayed about it for several days. The problem was that you had the answer before you did any of those things. And your presumption is, is that how could God not be impressed with your plan? How could God not be impressed with your plans? But it did cause them one other thing, to continually stumble. Look at verse 25. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gabeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men, all these that drew the sword. Right? Hmm. You know what's interesting about the way God works is he'll allow us to be very successful in some areas of our life. And then in areas, other areas, we'll find ourselves very unsuccessful. You ever notice that? Some people will be very successful in business. God will bless them. And then in other areas of their life, maybe family or marriage, they're just not successful. God kind of works that way. The children of Israel here were very successful in many areas of their life, but boy, they are failing miserably now. And it's not a one-time failure. This is a continual falling down. I wonder if you looked at your life and looked at yourself and the way that you make decisions. I wonder if you would find yourself continually falling down in the same area. I wonder if you'd be quicker than the children of Israel here and stop and ask the question, what am I missing? I wonder if you'd ask that question before you do too much damage to your family or to your marriage or to friendships or to your church or before you cause so much spiritual repair that needs to be done, you'll become discouraged and just drop out of the race altogether. At some point after continually falling down in the same area, you have to stop and say, God, what in the world am I missing? The total number is 40,000 that died. In the Bible, 40 is the number of judgment. 40 days and 40 nights it rained upon the earth because God was judging the world. Forty years the children of Israel spent in the wilderness because God was judging them. Forty days Moses spent on Mount Sinai to get the commandments that are also referred to in Scripture numerous times as judgments. To take it a step further, we look at the number 40,000 can also be attributed as the number of self-reliance. 40,000 stables of horses from Egypt is what Solomon had. And Psalm 20 in verse number 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord I God. 40,000 men prepared for battle before the Lord took Jericho. And when the Lord took Jericho, he said, I don't need your 40,000. I can do it all on my own. 40, the number of judgment. 40,000, the number of self-reliance. Now, here's their penitence. And this is where I want you to pay close attention. What did it involve? It involved, first of all, a change in priorities. Look at verse number 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings 
before the Lord. <laughs> Go back to verse number 11 real quick. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. In verse number 11, they were all in one mind and one accord to go to battle before they ever sought God. Now, what happens? Verse 26, all the children of Israel together in one accord are starting to rethink what they're doing. You know what? It also involved not only a change in priorities, but it involved a people that were poured out. You know what sometimes you need to do and I need to do? is just empty ourselves of ourselves. Because sometimes we get so full of ourselves, there's no room for God or the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening here is these people are just pouring themselves out saying, that's it, I've had enough, I don't want any more of what I want, I just want God to fill and control my life. I want God to make the decisions for me. So they're changing their priorities and they're pouring themselves out in verse number 26. And look at verse 28. And this is key. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Or shall I cease? Now we're starting to get somewhere. Now God is starting to make some headway. It involved a change in priorities. It involved a people that were poured out. It involved a willingness to change their plans. Because this is the first time that the option ever came up, should we not go to battle? Since verse 1, when they started making their plans. What was the result of this? What was the result of a change in priorities, a people that were poured out, a willingness to change their plans? How, what did this result in? Well, look at this. How about this? First of all, God's plan. That's what it resulted in. God, we are empty of ourselves. What do you want us to do? Should we go to battle? Should we stop? It's totally up to you, God. We're coming to you and we're not asking you to put your stamp of approval on my plans, right? We're coming to you, God, and we're saying, make the plans. And God says, okay, that sounds pretty good. But look at what God's plan was. And the Lord, at the end of verse 28, said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. Look, it wasn't that their plan was bad. It's the very thing that God tells them to do. Yeah, you would think at this point God would say, all right, that's it. Come on, we're going to do something totally different. God says, no. Go do it again. Exact same thing. It tells us that no matter how good our plans are, they aren't anything without God. That no matter how clever, how wise, how smart, no matter, oh, how foolproof it is, 
these plans aren't anything apart from God. You know what also it tells us? And these aren't even in my notes. God says, go up tomorrow. You know what? Not only does it need to be God's plan, but it needs to be God's time. Right? Sometimes you may have a great plan, it's just not God's time. God says, go up. Go to battle. Tomorrow. And then I'll deliver them into your hand. What else did it result in? Not only God's plan, but it resulted in God's delivery. Look at Judges chapter 20 and verse number 28. I will deliver them into thine hand. You know what the difference is? The difference is the children of Israel wanted to deliver them into their own hand. And God says, oh no, and it's my plans, and it's my time. Guess what? I'll deliver them. And I can do it so much better than you. And I can do it so much more efficient than you can. 40,000 men were ready to storm Jericho. God says, and it's over. That's a lot more efficient. So what did they get? They got God's plan. They got God's time. They got God's delivery. And guess what? Just like you'd expect, they get God's victory. Look at verse number 46. So that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness and to the rock of Ramon and, ab and abode in the rock of Ramon four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well as the men of every city as the beast and all that came to hand. Also they set on fire all the cities that they came to. Hey man, God does a good job. You think about this 400,000 soldiers could not whoop 26,000 men without God. Amen. I don't care how big your plans are. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how powerful it is. I don't care how foolproof it is. All I know is that Scripture tells me 400,000 soldiers couldn't beat 26,000 men. Even the simplest task without God will be difficult. Amen. Amen. Have you made presumptuous plans? Maybe you're in the process of making presumptuous plans. Maybe you're in a predicament right now and you've got to make decisions and there's some problems, some dilemma happening and maybe there's even a disaster. But boy, you've got to make decisions here. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't formulate your plan and go to God and say, God, will you put your stamp of approval on what I got here? Can I ask you to lay your plans at the altar? And go to God first and say, God, would you just give me what you want me to do? And if there's an area in your life where you're continually falling, maybe that's an area where you're continually making presumptuous plans. 